Okay, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Angus Jackson from Sea Search today, who's going to talk to us about uh, crawfish in the southwest of England. And I'm particularly pleased about this because I believe, although uh, Angus may correct me part way through the talk, but I believe this is a rarity in that it's a, a good news story for invertebrates. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Angus, and I look forward to hearing more about crawfish. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kieran. Um, uh, nice to see you all here today, such a, a variety of people from all over the place. So hopefully I can uh, tell you a bit of an interesting story about uh, about crawfish. And this is specifically focusing on the southwest of England um, and the, the coast around there. So scientific name, Palinurus elephas um, is uh, the spiny lobster or crawfish. And these are found all over the world. There are different species in uh, New Zealand, in the Caribbean, um, in the tropics. Um, and, and we're fortunate enough to have uh, um, two species actually here, but uh, one is very much a deep water species. And the, the European spiny lobster is what we're talking about today, um, which is found in the kind of the shallow rocky reefs um, around, uh, around Britain. Just to start off, just to clear up any misconceptions, this is not about crayfish, um, uh, the freshwater uh, species, um, which we have uh, a couple in Britain, one native, the white clawed crayfish, and uh, a problematic um, invasive uh, signal crayfish from the, from the States. These are all very much freshwater uh, aquatic uh, animals rather than marine animals. So we're not going to be talking about these, we're going to be focusing about the, the spiny lobsters um, that live in the sea. So this is a, a large, really quite bonkersly colourful um, decapod crustacean related to uh, crabs and lobsters and prawns. Um, doesn't have the great big uh, claws like uh, crabs and lobsters, but it has these remarkable long antennae, really bright colours, very interesting behaviours, um, and yeah, a, a great characterful uh, member of the um, assemblage of species living on rocky reefs. It occurs from north of the UK, a few records across from Norway, down to the Azores um, and Portugal on the uh, Atlantic coastline and right the way through the Western Mediterranean. So to set the scene, uh, I'd like to play just a, a quick five minute video um, from the, the fabulous Sue Daly from Sark in the Channel Islands. So um, I'm going to set this going at the moment. If any hiccups occur or there are problems with the, the, the visualization of the video, please do let me know and uh, we'll see what we can do. But so I'll, I'll leave you in, uh, in Sue's hands for the next five minutes. Fifty years ago, crawfish were plentiful here in the Channel Islands. They were an important commercial species. In an article published in the Guernsey Evening Press and Star in 1967, pot fisherman John Carey stated that between 45 to 55 percent of his income was made from crawfish, and that for other fishermen it was up to 80 percent. At the same time, scuba diving was becoming affordable, and divers also targeted the crawfish, making catches of between 50 and 70 a day. Not surprisingly, the number of crawfish dwindled. The divers and fishermen blamed each other, but between them, the stock was virtually wiped out. By the time I learnt to dive in 1988, crawfish were extremely rare. Some years I'd see one, occasionally two, but most years I'd see none at all. That is, until 2014, when I started seeing something remarkable happening here in the waters around my home island of Sark. The reefs around Sark form a stunning underwater landscape. that's home to a fascinating and diverse 
vast variety of marine life. Once you venture deeper beneath the kelp line, animal life takes over, and sponges, anemones, and other attached creatures compete for space on the rocky ledges and walls. The most colourful are the corals, including sea fans and soft corals. This is also the realm of the crawfish. This species occurs in the Eastern Atlantic, from Norway to Morocco, as well as in the Mediterranean. It feeds by night on a wide variety of small animals and carrion. It lacks the large front claws of lobsters and crabs, but instead uses its extremely long antennae for defence. Like all crustaceans, crawfish shed their shells to grow and they reach maturity at between four and five years old. Males are generally larger and can grow up to 60 centimetres long and weigh over eight kilos. Both sexes can live for more than 15 years. Crawfish are classed as vulnerable on the IUCN's Red List of Endangered Species and in the UK there are Biodiversity Action Plan species. Three years ago, I began seeing juvenile crawfish here around Sark for the first time. They were tiny, about the length of a thumb from head to tail. Since then, I've recorded them at more and more sites here, as well as seeing them get larger. This summer, I dived some of the reefs around Sark specifically to record crawfish numbers. During my seven survey dives, I've seen an amazing 15 crawfish, including two that were large enough to be within the legal landing size. Diving friends on the other islands and around the southwest of the UK have also been seeing young crawfish. And the Marine Conservation Society's Sea Search project has recorded a huge rise in crawfish sightings around England in the last three years. Could this be the beginning of a recovery for this beautiful and valuable crustacean? If so, I believe that we need to act now and designate crawfish as a completely protected species until such time as there are sufficient numbers to make carefully regulated fishing for them sustainable. That would be good news for fishermen and those of us who enjoy watching these fabulous creatures in the beautiful underwater landscapes where they live. I don't believe putting a complete ban on any kind of fishing for crawfish is going to impact anyone's livelihood. And we obviously have the perfect habitat for them here in the Channel Islands. Let's not see history repeat itself and crawfish wiped out again. Let's give the return of the crawfish all the help we can. Okay, so hopefully that uh, gives a bit of, um, uh, I don't know, inspiration about what a remarkable creature it is and the the beautiful uh, habitats where it uh, where it lives. Um, that video is five six years old now, so there's been there's been progress and and the situation is not quite the same as it was uh, back then. Um, so I'm hopefully give a bit of an update about. Uh, the, the current status and, and what's happening um, both in terms of the population and from uh, what we understand about the fishery for the crawfish and its, its biology. So historically it wasn't just around the Channel Isles that it had a valuable inshore fishery. Um, it was included in the west of Scotland and southwest Wales and right the way around the southwest corner of England. Um, it was an important economic uh, target for, for coastal fisheries. Um, and it wasn't just around the Channel Isles that that uh, um, fishery was uh, poorly managed um, and the population of crawfish collapsed almost completely. Um, shift from using pots and traps to really super efficient tangle nets, uh, 
were very effective at removing crawfish from, from their reef habitats. Divers picking them by hand again, also did a very good job of, uh, of, of clearing up. Um, so right the way through the 2000s, um, any assessment of, of crawfish was just seen to be in an unfavorable condition um, right, right across the Southwest, um, such that it became a protected species um, and its uh, designated feature within several uh, marine protected areas with the objective to recover to a, a good level again. But as with lots of uh, um, the, the less common uh, fisheries targets, there's no scientific stock assessment, very challenging to do that. And so the actual status of the species has been has been really uncertain for, for quite a while. And that, that plot on the bottom right there, you can really see how um, kind of the, the numbers of crawfish landed right the way through last century kind of declined away to just about zero um, before the turn of the millennium. Uh, but just as Sue described and others um, provided really nice, interesting anecdotal reports of um, a sudden reappearance, a resurgence of, of crawfish around the southwest from about 2014, 2015 onwards. That really was indicating the, the possibility of the population re-establishing firmly um, around the English coast. But for quite a while, there was a, um, a bit of uncertainty about that. Is this true? Where was this actually happening? Um, how many were involved? And what was the extent of the recovery? Um, and so my interest in this came from wanting to be able to see whether we can use uh, volunteers through citizen science um, collection of biological records to provide robust evidence for that, uh, that potential recovery. Um, and this is where uh, um, I'd like to introduce you to the Sea Search program that uh, that Kieran mentioned right back at the start there. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with it, uh, um, this is a, a fabulous citizen science initiative that's been um, going for a good long time now. We're celebrating our 35th year this year, um, and it uh, involves volunteer scuba divers and snorkelers. Um, and the Sea Search program is a partnership. It's led by the Marine Conservation Society, but involves a range of other organizations, um, wildlife trusts and conservation agencies and diving organizations. It's a really dynamic, uh, effective collaboration. Um, we have a national coordinator, Charlotte Bolton, who um, ensures consistency, maintains standards, keeps the whole show on the road, and uh, is a fantastic driving force behind the, the whole program. There's a network of regional coordinators that uh, ensure activity happens uh, in the various regions around the British Isles and Ireland. And we have uh, a set of tutors who deliver the, the training required to become a, a sea search recorder. So what, that's all well and good, but what does Sea Search actually do? Um, we train volunteers to make biological, biological records underwater. So we don't train them how to dive, but we train them as divers how to record and to tell them or uh, encourage them to learn about what they're actually looking at, what they're seeing um, in terms of taxonomic identity. Uh, we organize uh, surveys of organize trips to go out and collect information in particular habitats, particular places, um, but there's also a whole bunch of kind of independent surveys that individuals do off their own bat as well. And most importantly, we make the data that are collected available for all to use. So it's all free open access data um, intended to support protection and conservation of the marine environment. And in doing all that, we are targeting gaps in our current knowledge, supporting what we know already, um, targeting those species and habitats that are classed as priority, those most in need of support, but also record common taxa as well. So we're not just focusing on the funky, sexy animals and plants, but to all the common uh, taxa too that are provide the context for, for, for what's happening in the marine environment. Um, we pay attention to rare, unusual um, and unusual species and those that may be indicators of changing climate. Um, those that have uh, arrived through man's action um, and, and may be becoming invasive, potentially causing problems uh, in our environment, so they're non-native species. And 
uh, it's not just about the biology, we record information about the habitat and the physical environment and what impact may have, have, have occurred there through, through human activity, such as fishing, ghost gear, litter, rubbish and damage. The training we provide occurs at multiple levels through kind of observer beginner level right the way through to specialist courses uh, about specific taxonomic groups. Historically, it was almost all to do with divers, but we've been expanding over the last few years to include snorkeling and participation on kind of shore surveys, broadening the uh, ability for, for people from all, all interests and all abilities to, to part, participate. So we're really proud that Sea Search uh, can, be, can be viewed as a, a large scale sustained time series. Um, with those 35 years of data covering um, just about every corner of uh, Britain and Ireland. Uh, we've got now over 830,000 species records, tens of thousands of habitat records, um, and involving over 3,300 different, different taxa. So this is a, a fabulous, fabulous resource, and um, I will shout and sing about it till, till the end of the day, um, every day, uh, if, if needed, because it, it's, a, it's a super, super thing to have, um, and we should be exploiting it and using it as, as much as we can. So that's, that's brilliant. We've got all this big data set. How is it, how is it used? Um, how is it being exploited? Well, historically, lots of the species records were there to support designation of protected areas, and we've got lots of nice examples of how that's happened. At the moment, we're contributing those open source data to larger national and global data sets. We're uh, participating in commissioned research using those data, um, doing our own independent research with those data, publishing in the scientific literature, and supporting student research projects. And we have ambitions in the future to be able to use some of the approaches that we've been developing to support monitoring of marine protected areas, to support fisheries management, um, and to move into kind of assessment of natural capital, the, 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 the value that these habitats along our coast can actually provide. So that's about the background of the, about sea search. Now back into focusing more on, on the crawfish. So, this is a little animated heat map to illustrate some of the change in distribution and the numbers of records for crawfish, crawfish that we've, we've seen in the SeaSearch database over the last um, 15 years or so. Uh, and this is just one illustration of one way that the data can be used to make a, a visual impact. So we can see the uh, screen just ticking year on year by year. The, color of the kind of the red intensity indicates more records um, and each year you can see very very few tiny little spaces here and there but once we get past 2014 we suddenly get these big strong areas with lots and lots of records spreading further west right the way um, out towards um, uh, out towards Dorset and, and Portland Bill. Um, so that, that's one way of which you can really say, wow, oh, okay, there's some numbers in a database there hidden in the background, but how can we actually um, provide some visual interpretation of that? And, and using these heat maps is one way of doing that. And using those sorts of records, we can create a, a fairly naive estimate of the number of grid cells on the map where uh, a species of interest, in this case crawfish, can be found and we can see there's a nice increasing blue line there. But I say these are naive estimates for, for a good reason. And that's because when you have detection surveys by any kind of um, volunteer or um, kind of incidental ad hoc record of um, saying what you see on a, on a particular day, um, that issue is that if you don't see it, that is an, an ambiguous situation. You might not see it because it truly isn't at the site where you were, or it might be that you just didn't see it at that site and it was actually there. And if you don't see it, you don't know which of those is actually true. And so if you want to have a really good estimate of how many grid cells are occupied, not only do we need to count the number of occurrences, the number of times they were seen, but you also be able to estimate the probability that it was there, but you didn't see it. So what's the chance of detection? 
and those heat maps simply don't don't take that into account. This sort of ad hoc recording is also rather biased or the, uh, is open to influence by bias, whether that's through spatial variability in survey effort, temporal variability in survey effort, the amount of effort in an individual visit, so the longer you spend, the more things you're likely to record. And when you're in the sea, particularly, visibility is, is incredibly variable, and so detectability varies on local conditions from time to time and from place to place. So there's lots of potential for, for bias. And where those variables change, that will influence the likelihood that your specimens, your species, the things that you're looking for are actually visible or not. And any true trends in the population might be hidden or false trends might be created as a consequence of that, that change, in, um, in change in bias. And so that's, that's a, real, a real problem in, in interpreting those naive estimates of, uh, of occurrence. There is a solution that, that, that deals with many of these, these issues, and that involves statistical modeling of, of the, the process of, of um, recording observations. Um, and that estimates the probability of occurrence that a species occurs in a, in a grid accounting for the fact that it might have been overlooked, it might have been missed. And they use a, a series of repeated visits to a site to build up a, a history of detection. It uses a family of statistical approaches called Bayesian, Bayesian statistics. And lots of the methods uh, applied in this approach have been developed at the uh, Center for Ecology and Hydrology. And it's what's used extensively in the State of Nature report that some of you may have come across um, next one due out uh, a little later this year. And these population trends are now being modeled and calculated for 10,000 species, records of 10,000 species, predominantly terrestrial and freshwater, but now we're, we're starting to contribute marine species into the pool there as well. So really exciting developments in, in statistics and using that to get really valuable information about how populations of species are, are changing. So I, I took the programming code from the CEH approach um, and applied that to records from, from C-Search uh, in order to be able to generate that kind of separate aspect of looking at the occupancy and looking at the probability detection. And doing so minimizes some of the problems caused by those, those um, spatial and temporal biases that I mentioned a minute ago. In order to create a occupancy trend, a population trend for, for crawfish. And in doing so, there's the blue line that we saw for our naive estimates. And if we add in the probability of non-detection, then the black line with some uh, boundary of confidence around about that um, shows that uh, the naive proportions are always going to be an underestimate and the reality is more likely to be a, a positive outlook. So that's, that's a good, re, very good, strong reason for applying these sorts of models to a series of records. So I say I, I built this occupancy model using sea search data um, on a, a grid of the, the seabed broken into one by one kilometer squares using records from over 22 years. The model gets iterated tens of thousands of times, requires um, at least two visits to a site in, in different years. And I produced information about crawfish, about brown crab or edible crab and, and lobster. And now I've also applied those models to over 300 species that are going to be going into the next State and Nature report. So really brilliant demonstration that we can take citizen science, um, these volunteer programs, the value, uh, the, the data collected by those can be super valuable and apply to these, these new methods. And um, pleased uh, earlier this year, uh, sorry, maybe back, back, back in last year, um, to, to have the, the output of that work, work published. Um, and I think Kieran's kindly put a, a link to that um, in, in the chat if anyone's interested. But uh, we're all interested in what, what actually we, we found from that. Um, so the plots on the right hand side, if we concentrate on the bottom one first, we can see uh, hopefully you can see my little red laser pointer there right the way through 
up to 2014, the occupancy of crawfish in England was pretty much down at zero. Very few grid squares were found to be containing crawfish. And then following 2014, there was a, a sudden uptick, an upsurge in the number of records, exactly as Sue described, exactly as the other anecdotal um, records suggested. Um, lobster and brown crab, whilst they are much more uh, likely to be present in, in grid cells around the coast, didn't show that same pattern. So this is something very clearly happening just to just to crawfish. It wasn't a consequence of um, changing fishing pressure or uh, conservation measures um, where, where these things are found. So this is something very, very particular to crawfish. If we look at a, a more a restricted spatial area, like let's look at the, the area for Cornwall, um, where historically perhaps crawfish were most abundant originally and we can see there's a huge increase in occupancy um, of all the places that were visited at uh, a couple of years ago many of them were now uh, supporting um, individual crawfish and that's just incredibly good news um, and as, as Ken said a really uh, positive good news story to uh, to talk about it's not the same everywhere so if you look at uh, neighboring neighboring counties of Devon, we have the same sort of timing, we have the same sort of upsurge, but not to quite the same extent. So it's not quite as, as concentrated as it was in, in Cornwall. So those, um, that is great news, unquestionable, but given that big upsurge in, in population, um, there is a risk of, uh, us returning to our old bad habits of unsustainable netting, um, inappropriate collection by divers. Um, and so the intention is to be able to use these occupancy models to provide supporting evidence for, for management, to, to make sure that management that is applied to try and maintain a sustainable fishery, to stop it being destroyed again, um, can, can be provided. So that's information in the right time and the right, right space about, about crawfish. And those sorts of activities might include um, specification of new designated areas, concentrated bylaws or um, particular focus within subsets of existing designated areas, setting closed uh, areas for fisheries, applying gear restrictions, size and bag limits, um, seasonal close, uh, closed times. So there's lots of different ways in which uh, fishery can be managed based on information derived from, from occupancy models. And we shouldn't be surprised that there is interest in, uh, in crawfish beyond uh, us as just biologists. They have great economic value. They're a really lucrative um, potential uh, target. I mean, at 28 pounds a kilo, that's a, there's gonna be a serious incentive to, to harvest those and, and small reason. Um, so, there has been very rapidly a renewed interest from fishers for uh, being able to to exploit uh, the, these uh, these crawfish, and um, uh, we we can we see there being increased take, increased um, value derived from those. If we look at uh, um, some some landings from from colleagues in in the Scilly Isles, um, small background. Uh, levels of landings right the way up till 2017, a couple of years lag from the increase in the actual crawfish themselves. And then woof, a great big uptake in the numbers that are available to be caught and the numbers that are being landed. Uh, and so great for fishermen, but does raise concern about whether this is a, a sustainable, sustainable level of activity. So what's actually happening in, in the fishery beyond that uh, upsurge in, in number of landings? There is actually no limit on the quantity landed or the amount of effort. So there's no management about uh, uh, effort-based uh, metrics. There are statutory restrictions on minimum landing size. Um, so the carapace of the animal as a, at a national level has to be more than 95 millimeters long um, for it to be big enough to be kept. Otherwise it has to go back in the water. Um, but there are in places bylaws that have been enacted to make that minimum catch size 
larger, so 110 millimeters carapace length, within the kind of the six mile limit of, of the coasts. You're not allowed to take buried females with eggs. Um, you're not allowed to take um, animals that have previously been marked having had eggs or those that have got damaged tails. And if you're going to do this commercially, you need to apply for a permit and to report regularly on what you're catching. If you're doing it only on a recreational basis, then you're limited to, to two per day. So there are some um, restrictions in place about uh, how many get removed um, and how big they are. But it's unlikely, I think, that just this minimum landing size by itself is adequate to prevent overfishing. Um, and maybe some additional management uh, um, actions are needed really to, to, to ensure that uh, longevity of the population. And in some places, this, is, this has absolutely happened. Um, so on Sark, following Sue's video, the next year, um, there was a complete ban on landing crawfish that still persists within the three mile limit of the, the coast of the island. And that's a, a really definite action to um, in, encourage that population to be really stable, really properly established before allowing the, uh, the fishery to, to reopen to it. There are some perhaps less encouraging signals that uh, the amount of landings per effort of fishing, um, particularly in Cornwall, might be starting to, to peter off, to, to start not to peter off, to, to level off and maybe even to decline a little bit now, which is suggesting maybe that more are being removed than can be supported by the, uh, the environment. Um, and as part recognition for that, uh, fishers are, have voluntarily uh, agreed to extend that larger carapace size um, catch limit beyond the six mile limit out to, out to 12 miles. Um, so the, the fishermen are really involved in this. They're proactively making choices to um, try and maintain the, the fishery as it is without driving it down again. There are other voluntary initiatives. So the Cornwall Wildlife Trust has a project where it's encouraging divers and dive clubs and skippers of dive boats to take a pledge that um, they will not be collecting uh, crawfish for, um, for recreational use or individual use. And we can get information from, from divers, from our volunteers, from the sea search recorders, uh, to see what's actually happening um, on, on the ground, separately to what, what we can uh, discover from the fisheries landings. So just as Sue described, that cohort of new thumb-sized recruits that appeared in 2014 have continued to, to grow through. Now fully adult may well be doing their own reproduction. There are large individuals present. Sue described, I think, 15 individuals seen right the way around Sark. In several places, you may find up to 15 individuals on a, on a dive um, in, in some parts of the, uh, the coastline. Uh, and that's a, that's a fabulous thing. That, that's really um, getting back towards what might have been there uh, 100 years ago, or maybe even 50 years ago. It wasn't just based on one single recruitment back in 2014. There has been some ongoing recruitment. Where those have come from is, is up for discussion and uh, investigation, but there are small numbers of new small individuals uh, appearing on the reefs as we go through time. So it's going to be particularly useful to assess where those are coming from. Are, are the females around our coastline starting to reproduce uh, in, in situ, or are we dependent on immigrant plankton uh, larvae of, of the small crawfish coming in from elsewhere? And there's lots of, uh, lots of interesting work to be done on that yet. Um, for those that dive and see crawfish but aren't part of Sea Search, there's now an online recording facility available through iRecord, where individual records of crawfish and the habitat and how big they are and so forth can all be recorded nice and easily. And the joy of, or one of the joys of the occupancy model approach is that every year you get a new set of data, you can rerun the model and extend the trend line of the, of the population and see what's happened in your most recent year of data. And so all of that will be happening in the, uh, in the next few months. I'm going to tell you a bit more now about some other really cutting edge research that's happening that uh, 
I'm not directly involved in, but we, we have colleagues through the University of Plymouth and the University of Exeter um, that uh, are um, working in this. Colleagues in the Marine Conservation Society are also involved in this in this project. And that's the Fish Intel project, which is multi-organization, maybe about 15 or 20 different organizations shared across England, France, and Belgium. Um, that is uh, set up to improve the ecological status of transitional waters um, along the coast of the channel. Um, and it's doing that by identifying habitat, which is important for fish, including crawfish, um, with the intention that that information can support more effective ecosystem-based management of, of fisheries. As an alternative, i say that um, ecosystem based because that's not the historical approach. The historical tendency for managing fisheries has been controlling quota, the number of fish that get caught and removed or the amount of effort that goes into catching fish. That's been the, the historical tendency for the way that fisheries get managed. But there's more and more move to try and take a more holistic, a more broad based approach, thinking about the environment that the fishing is happening in and managing that rather than um, the, the kind of the human fish, fishers activity. So being able to identify important habitat will contribute in a big way to being able to manage the, uh, the, the broader ecosystem rather than um, our, our human activity. And tagging species and being able to track them around and follow their behaviours, understand which habitats they're using, where they're going, when they're going and what they're doing um, will be really, really, really valuable. And so this Fish Intel project is tagging these four, uh, four species and so I'm particularly interested in what's, what's occurring with the crawfish. Um, and so there are 14 uh, marine conservation zones along the southwest coast that are um, include crawfish as a designated feature. And within these, the, the obvious question is spatial management. Is this ecosystem-based management an appropriate tool for conserving the species that has kind of come back from near extinction? Um, and the work has been focusing on the uh, Scilly Islands and uh, across the channel in northwest France. And when you say tagging, we're talking about acoustic tags here. These are things that are attached to the animal um, that produce uh, acoustic signals that are then detected by uh, a network of receivers. And over the last couple of years, 120 different individual crawfish have been captured um, and tagged with these acoustic tags, uh, captured by divers and tangle nets through a combination of um, commercial fishermen and uh, academics from uh, research organizations and fisheries organizations. Catching them, tagging them, putting them back where they were found and allowing them to go about doing their thing, producing these noise signals, uh, which are then detected by the network of the array of receivers that are deployed on the seabed. And we can see here that the whole project um, with the blue dots there has got this huge array of um, receivers across the Channel Coast now. Um, and there are other projects with the black dots that, that are other, other initiatives to record um, sound signals from, from tagged animals. Uh, so we yeah, big international big value, cutting edge um, research, working out who's going where and, and when and, and doing what. Really exciting. So if we look at the uh, array set out um, of receivers to study crawfish uh, around Scilly, um, there's a network of 15 receivers, I think uh, now, um, set out at two different scales to look at the kind of the fine spatial scale of individual movements and the kind of the broader area occupied by these tagged individuals. And over the last year, I think those tagged animals have now been redetected over 370,000 times. Um, they're starting to be able to pull out really interesting behaviors, uh, not necessarily expected before differences between males and females and how they move and how often they move, how far they move. So just dis distinct differences there. And that's already an important, important learning. Um, if you are going to manage uh, a stock effectively, then knowing that males and females, different components of the breeding cycle will be behaving differently is a really, really valuable thing to have. 
and this for me, this this blows my mind. I absolutely love this this figure. It's a, a three dimensional representation of a rocky reef, and some of the crawfish also had depth transmitters um, put on. So it wasn't just in the horizontal space that you could knew where it was. It knew how deep it was below the surface of the water, and the green areas are where the animal was choosing to hang out. It wasn't going right at the top of the rocks, it wasn't going right down in the deeper water. So we can start to understand that there's really specific, not necessarily requirements, but but choices made by the animals about where they're going to, to be. And again, that has to be really valuable information if we're going to protect, manage the fishery, um, conserve, understand the these species, we need to have this sort of information. So it's super, super valuable. So hopefully that's been a informative kind of story about what's happened to crawfish, how we can use volunteers to um, collect information to get more robust analyses and more robust understanding about what's going on and how we can use really interesting research to provide information that's valuable that can then be applied to make better decisions about how to manage fisheries on an ecosystem-based level rather than on an effort and quota-based level. So the happy story is that, yes, there absolutely has been a, a really good, strong recovery by crawfish in the Southwest. And it's not often we can come out with positive stories like that. Um, and that positive story is entirely uh, endorsed by supported by analyses of citizen science data from from volunteers um, so we should be absolutely supporting volunteers encouraging volunteers to go out and collect more of these records not just for crawfish but for for everything because they can be applied those records can be applied to these really interesting um, statistical analyses providing very useful information as a consequence of that recovery no surprise that the uh, the fisheries are expanding again but this brings with it risks about whether that uh, um, that level of activity is sustainable, um, given the current management of only minimum landing size. There's no doubt that managing uh, a sustainable fishery is going to be challenging because the economic value of crawfish, they are expensive, they are tasty, and there is high demand, particularly from uh, consumers on the continent. Um, so. It's something that we absolutely have to keep an eye on, and we do absolutely need to make sure that suitable management is in place to prevent the same sort of thing happening as, as happened back in the 70s and 80s. And spatial management, um, ecosystem-based fisheries management might be a really powerful tool to do that. And collecting information to understand where the animals are and when and what they're doing and how far they're moving, particularly if we're thinking about moving uh, from one country to another, one stock area to another, one fisheries area to another, we need that information in order to be able to do those, uh, uh, to understand what the best management to apply. And, and here's the, I think for me, the, the key message here, not one source of information is going to be adequate to do this by itself, fisheries landings tell you some information, but not all that you need. By itself, statistically designed rigorous research tells you lots of very good detailed information about small spatial areas and about small windows in time. And the observations from long-standing citizen science data sets gives you a broader picture, um, a longer term picture. Each one of those by themselves is not enough to provide all the information required. It needs combination, it needs collaboration and cooperation amongst those, those areas in order to be able to get all the, the, the information of value that's needed um, to, to be able to make good decisions and manage our, manage our um, marine species of economic value in, in an effective way. So I will wind up there. Uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, hopefully you'll have a, a bunch of questions and I'll be delighted to be able to answer them 
uh, now or uh, through through the chat later um, or through feedback um, through Kieran's blog. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much.